Hi guys. So today we're going to talk about chapter nine, which is the muscular system. I've divided it into two parts. The first part, we're going to talk about the types of muscle and what they do. The second part is more of the gross anatomy of the skeletal muscle. So it's going to talk about the muscles themselves. First, it's important to know the functions of the muscular system. Of course, we know that it is body movements but it also helps maintain our posture and produces heat. So when you go outside and it's cold and you're shivering, that's your muscles contracting to actually produce heat. There are three main types of muscle, skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Cardiac and smooth muscle, we're going to talk a little bit about at the end of this, but we really focus on cardiac muscle in the heart and smooth muscle in the digestive tract. So this lecture is going to focus mostly on skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is voluntary, which means it's consciously controlled. So we can move when we want. It's attached to the bones of the skeleton, and it is not branched. It is striated, which means that there are stripes in it. Cardiac muscle is the heart. It is involuntary, so it's not consciously controlled. So we don't have to tell our heart to keep beating, which is probably a good thing. It is branched though, which is a big difference between cardiac and skeletal muscle. And it is also striated. Smooth muscle is in the walls of the internal organs like the digestive tract. It is again involuntary, so we don't have to tell our stomach to start digestion. But a big difference between smooth muscle and the other two, it is not striated. Skeletal muscle attaches to the bones and the skin of the face. Again, it's voluntary. And a skeletal muscle is actually an organ of the muscular system. Skeletal muscles are composed of more than just skeletal muscle tissue. They also have nervous tissue, blood, and connective tissues. The connective tissue cover some of the skeletal muscles. Fascia cover a lot of the muscles themselves. Tendons, as you can see in the picture, connect muscle to bone. And then aponeuroses cover like our head. As far as the muscles themselves, there are three main connective tissue coverings. The epimysium surrounds the entire muscle. The entire muscle is made up of bundles of fascicles. Now the fascicles are surrounded by a paramysium. And then inside the fascicles are bundles of myofibrils, which are actually the muscle cells. Each myofibril is surrounded by an endomysium. So the myofibril is the smallest component. Those are surrounded by endomysium. Groups of myofibrils make up a fascicle, which is surrounded by the paramysium. And groups of fascicles make up the whole muscle, which is surrounded by the epimysium. The skeletal muscle fiber is actually a muscle cell. They are multinucleated. The sarcolemma is equivalent to the plasma membrane. The sarcoplasm is like the cytoplasm. They have a lot of myofibrils, which the myofibrils are the actin and myosin filaments. Now these are the actual contractile proteins that do the contracting. A sarcomere is the functional unit of muscle. So the sarcomere itself contracts. So the sarcomere, which is made up of these actin and myosin filaments is gonna shorten when it contracts. The sarcoplasmic reticulum holds calcium the transverse tubules are going to transmit the muscle impulses to the interior of the cell. So the impulse is going to run across the sarcolemma and then down the T-tubules to get into the interior. A triad is one T-tubule and two sarcoplasmic reticulum cisternae. The myofibrils consist of the sarcomeres connected end to end. So a sarcomere again is the functional unit, so that's what does the contracting and there's a bunch of them end-to-end -end that make up the myofibril. The striation pattern is going to be based on the myofilaments that are inside. The sarcomeres contain an I-band, which is made up of thin filaments, an A-band, which is both thick and thin filaments, an H-zone, which is thick filaments, a Z-line, or often referred to as a Z-disc, and an M-line. The striation itself has two main parts the I-band and the A-band. The I-band is a light band composed of the actin filaments. 
and the A band is darker and it's composed of the myosin filaments with a little bit of actin filaments thrown in. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it. Actin is thinner, so the band could be lighter. Myosin is thicker, so the band would be darker. Plus, it has actin filaments overlapping, so of course it would be darker. The H zone is right in the center of the A band, and that is only myosin filaments. The Z line, again, anchors those filaments in place, and it's the boundary of the sarcomere. So the Z band run, or the sarcomere runs from Z disc to Z disc. And then the M line anchors the thick filaments, and that's the center of the A band. So if you look at that picture, you can see the sarcomeres from Z disc to Z disc. So what's going to happen when the muscle contracts is it's going to shorten up. So the Z discs are going to get closer together. Now, if you look at the bottom picture C, it shows you how the thin filaments are kind of around the thick filaments. The thick filaments are the darker purple and thicker lines, of course. So what happens when the Z discs compress and get closer together, when those actin and myosin contract, those actin filaments are going to move in closer to that M line. And they're going to, basically the I bands are going to shorten in a nutshell. So the thick filaments are the myosin protein, and these are what form cross bridges. The thin filaments are the actin protein, and they're also associated with the regulatory proteins troponin and tropomyosin. Now those prevent the cross bridge formation when the muscle is not contracting. So if you look at the picture, the purple myosin, you can see the head sticking up. They look like two twisted golf clubs. And then the heads are the myosin heads. Now those heads are what bind to the actin filaments. The actin filaments look like a string of pearls. And the blue in the picture are the troponin and tropomyosin complex. So what happens when the muscle is not contracting, the troponin tropomyosin complex blocks the binding site. Once the muscle is going to contract, the troponin tropomyosin complex moves out of the way and opens up the binding site so that the myosin head can fit right in there and bind. Contraction actually requires a bunch of chemicals and cellular components and it results from a movement within those myofibrils. So the actin and myosin filaments slide past one, one another and shorten that sarcomere. The muscle fiber shortens and pulls on the attachment points. The neuromuscular junction is very important. The neuromuscular junction is the synapse, which is the functional connection between the neuron and the muscle. It's also called the myoneural junction. But whatever you want to call it, it's the site of where the axon of the motor neuron and the skeletal muscle fiber interact. So the motor neuron is going to come down, and then the axon terminals are going to kind of sit in that synapse. So the area between the axon terminal and the muscle is going to be the synaptic cleft. Skeletal muscle fibers contract when they're stimulated by a neuron. So the parts of the neuromuscular junction are the motor neuron, the motor end plate, the synaptic cleft, the synaptic vesicles, and the neurotransmitter. So if you look at that picture up there, you can see that axon terminal of the motor neuron sitting inside the synapse. So again, the synapse is that functional connection between the two. Inside of the motor neuron, you're going to have little synaptic vesicles filled with the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. When the, the action potential travels down the motor neuron, so when that impulse comes down the motor neuron to the axon terminal, acetylcholine is going to be released. It's going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to the receptors on the muscle cell. From there, that's going to initiate the impulse to travel down the sarcolemma, eventually to go down the T-tubules and initiate a contraction. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter, as I said. That nerve impulse is going to cause the release of acetylcholine from those synaptic vesicles. The synaptic vesicles bind to the acetylcholine receptors on the motor end plate of the muscle cell. 
The acetylcholine is going to change the membrane permeability to sodium and potassium, which is going to generate the muscle impulse or action potential. The impulse causes the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is going to eventually lead to a muscle contraction. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder where antibodies will actually attack the acetylcholine receptors on the skeletal muscle fibers in the neuromuscular junction, so they won't be able to contract. The person may have only one third of the normal number of acetylcholine receptors. So that's gonna to lead to a lot of muscle weakness and fatigue, and it's gonna be widespread. Treatments, you can use a drug that inhibits acetylcholinesterase. Acetylcholinesterase, ASE should tell you it's an enzyme, and what it does is that stops the breakdown of acetylcholine. So it leaves acetylcholine out in the synaptic cleft for a longer period of time, so that maybe it can bind to the receptors and the person's muscles can contract. Immunosuppressant drugs to stop the antibodies from attacking the receptors. Administering antibodies that are gonna inactivate harmful antibodies or plasma exchange to try to totally change them out. Muscle contraction is going to rely on excitation contraction coupling. This is the connection between the muscle fiber stimulation and the actual contraction. So when the muscle is relaxing, calcium ions are gonna be stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the troponin tropomyosin complex is going to cover the binding site on the actin filaments. Once the muscle is stimulated, the muscle, muscle impulse is going to cause the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium into the cytosol. The calcium will bind to the troponin and then change its conformation, change its shape. So the troponin is going to move the tropomyosin out of the way and alter the position of the tropomyosin. So now the binding site on the actin is gonna be exposed the myosin head can bind right into it and form a cross bridge. So here's a picture of the whole thing. So if you look up top there, you've got the troponin tropomyosin in place blocking that active site. Once calcium is released, you're going to have ATP bind to the myosin head and activate it. The calcium is going to bind to the troponin and it's going to move the tropomyosin out of the way. So now in that second picture, you can see the binding sites on the actin. The myosin head, now phosphorylated, is going to fit right into that binding site, and then it's going to form a cross bridge. It's going to move the whole actin filament in what's called the power stroke, and it's going to bring it closer together. Then it's going to detach, Another ATP will have to come in, phosphorylate myosin head. Myosin head is going to attach, form the cross bridges, pull it in in the power stroke, and then detach. And this has to happen the entire time for a continued contraction. So ATP comes in, binds to the myosin head, calcium binds to the troponin to move the tropomyosin out of the way, Myosin binds to the actin, pulls it forward in the power stroke, detaches. Another ATP has to come in, bind to the myosin head. It will attach to the actin, pull it forward, detach, and that will just continue to happen until the contraction is over. The sliding filament model of muscle contraction just refers to the fact that the sarcomeres are shortening and the thick and thin filaments are actually just sliding past one another. The H zones and the I bands are going to narrow, and the Z lines move closer together. The thick and thin filaments do not change length themselves. It's just the overlap between the filaments that increases. So if you look at the top picture there, that is a muscle at rest. So the Z lines are pretty far apart. There's room to slide with the actin over the myosin. In the second picture, it's starting to contract, so the Z lines are closer together. The actin and myosin are starting to overlap more, and that H zone is very narrow. 
And in the bottom one, that's a fully contracted muscle where the Z discs are as short as they're going to get. They're as close together as they can get. The actin and myosin filaments are as overlapped as they're going to get. And that H zone is almost non-existent. So you have to remember that the actin and myosin filaments aren't changing length. They're just sliding over each other. So the sarcomere is contracting. The Z lines are getting closer together. So the whole sarcomere is shortening. But the filaments themselves do not change length. They just slide over one another. So just picture it like normally they're here. And now it's going to contract, so they're going to slide over one another. So cross-bridge cycling just explains the process of what's going on. So the myosin head attaches to the actin binding site, forming that cross-bridge. The myosin cross-bridge pulls the actin towards the center of the sarcomere. ATP is going to be needed for every time we want this to happen because the ATP is going to phosphorylate the myosin head. And then it's going to activate it basically to attach to the actin filament, form that cross bridge, and pull it over. So myosin head attaches to the actin binding site, forms the cross bridge, pulls the actin closer to the center. ADP and the phosphate are going to be released. A new ATP comes in, binds to the myosin. It's going to link to the actin and form the cross bridge. ATP is going to split. The myosin cross bridge goes back to the original position. So again, a lot of ATP is going to be necessary for contraction to happen. So calcium is needed because calcium has to bind to troponin so that tropomyosin can get pulled out of the way. ATP is needed for every power stroke. So ATP binds to the myosin for the power stroke. And then it's going to be released, so a new one has to come in for the next power stroke. Once the neural stimulation of the muscle fiber stops, it needs to relax. So here's where that acetylcholinesterase comes in, which again, remember, that's an enzyme, and it's going to decompose any remaining acetylcholine that's left in the synapse. The muscle impulse stops once the acetylcholine is decomposed. The stimulus to the sarcolemma and the muscle fiber membrane is going to stop. The calcium pump is going to actually pump calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The troponin tropomyosin complex is going to go back into its original position and cover the binding site on the actin. And the myosin and actin binding are now stopped so the muscle fiber can relax. So, in a nutshell, what happens? Initially, the nerve fiber is going to bring the action potential down the axon to the axon terminal. That's going to signal the synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to the receptors on the motor end plate. That's going to carry that muscle impulse down the sarcolemma, down the T-tubules. As it's going down the T-tubules, that cues the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. The calcium is going to go and bind to troponin. Troponin will move the tropomyosin out of the way, so now the active sites are going to be open. ATP is going to come in, bind to the myosin head. It's going to phosphorylate it. That activates the myosin head to bind to the actin. It's going to do a power stroke and pull the actin in towards the center of the sarcomere. So now the filaments are going to start to slide across each other. Once the power stroke happens, the ATP goes away, or ADP, I should say, goes away. Now another ATP molecule has to come in. Attaches to the myosin head, phosphorylates it, activates it. Myosin head binds to the actin, another power stroke shortens it up even more. So now the fibers slide across even more. This keeps happening until the transmission stops. Once the neural stimulation stops, acetylcholinesterase is released. It's going to decompose any acetylcholine. Once the acetylcholine is decomposed, the muscle impulse is going to stop. That's going to stop the stimulation of the sarcolemma. 
the calcium pump is going to move calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is going to take it away from the troponin tropomyosin complex. So it will go back into its original position to cover the binding sites on actin. Now we can't have any more power strokes and the muscle fiber is going to relax. And that is muscle contraction in its finest. Where do we get ATP? We only have a small amount in reserve. Creatine phosphate is the initial source of energy to regenerate ATP from ADP and phosphate. But cellular respiration is where we get most of the ATP. So we have the anaerobic phase, which is glycolysis. That occurs in the cytoplasm and only produces two ATP, so not too much. The aerobic phase is where we get the money. The citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain that occur in the mitochondria produce the most ATP. We have myoglobin stores extra oxygen in the muscles so that we can be sure that aerobic respiration will happen so that we have enough ATP for muscle contraction to occur. During rest or even moderate exercise, the respiratory and the cardiovascular systems will supply enough oxygen to support aerobic respiration. But if we shift the metabolism from aerobic to anaerobic, like if we're doing really strenuous activity, the respiratory and cardiovascular systems can't keep up. So lactic acid is going to be produced as a result. It's the same thing like if you're exercising and you're not breathing properly. You're just holding your breath almost, which is why they tell you to breathe all the time when you're exercising. Or if you're a short distance runner and you just run a 100 meter dash or whatever. You do not need oxygen for that, or you're not using oxygen properly during exercise, so you're going to start to feel that burn. Well, that burn is lactic acid building up. The oxygen debt is the amount of oxygen needed by the liver cells to convert all of that accumulated lactic acid to glucose and to restore muscle ATP and creatine phosphate concentrations. So here's a picture showing you. Glycogen, remember, is just the storage form of glucose. So we need energy to synthesize ATP. We need oxygen in order for aerobic respiration to happen. So without oxygen, we're going to have lactic acid formed. Now the liver can convert that lactic acid back to pyruvic acid, but it takes some time. So we need a lot of oxygen coming in in order to function properly, we should say. So next time you're exercising, make sure that you are actually breathing because when they say feel that burn, it's not necessarily a good thing to feel that burn. And the more oxygen that you carry, the longer it's going to take to recover. Muscle fatigue happens when your muscles get too tired and they cannot contract. Common causes are decreased blood flow. If you have an ion imbalance across the sarcolemma, loss of desire to continue exercising, or an accumulation of lactic acid, which is kind of a controversial thing. Some people say that if you have too much lactic acid built up, your muscles just get tired and they can't contract anymore. Other people say that that's not really a thing. Muscle cramps are sustained involuntary muscle contractions. They can be caused by changes in electrolyte concentration and the extracellular fluids. Oftentimes you can get them if you're running, let's say, and you're really not a runner. If you do strenuous activity, maybe even the next day you'll start getting cramping. And it's just kind of a side effect, I guess you would say. The Golgi tendon organ is a very important thing and you need to know it for your final. It is a proprioceptive or a proprioceptive receptor that's located in the tendons at the end of the muscles. Remember, proprioception is the ability of our body to tell our brain where we're at in space. So these proprioceptive receptors give information to our brain on what we're doing and where we're at. These are going to be stimulated if there's an increased muscle tension or contraction, because what they do is they try to inhibit further contraction. So basically, they're going to tell the brain that we need to stop doing that before we get hurt. Heat is always going to be a byproduct of cellular respiration in cells. Muscle cells are a major source of body heat. 
more than half of the energy released in cellular respiration becomes heat. Less than half is transferred to ATP. Blood is going to transport heat throughout our body core. Now we know that heat is a byproduct of basically everything we do. A lot of the energy is lost as heat and we can't use that heat for anything. So our body will get hot when we exercise, let's say, and then what happens? We sweat trying to get rid of that heat. Muscle contraction can be observed by removing a single skeletal muscle fiber and then connecting it to a device that's going to basically record changes in the overall length of the muscle fiber. Electrical stimulator is going to promote the contractions. So you can actually take just one single skeletal muscle fiber and connect it to stimulators and watch it contract. Kind of cool. The threshold stimulus is the minimum strength of stimulation of a muscle fiber required to cause contraction. So basically that's just what it takes to get the muscle fiber to contract. How much of a stimulation does it take? When the strength of the stimulus reaches that threshold, the action potential is going to be generated. The impulse will spread through the muscle fiber, which again will release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and activate that cross bridge formation. One action potential from a motor neuron releases enough acetylcholine to produce this threshold stimulus in muscle fiber, causing a muscle impulse. So motor neurons basically release enough acetylcholine to sustain a contraction is all that's saying. A twitch is a contractile response of a single muscle fiber to a single impulse. It goes through a latent period, then a period of contraction, and then a period of relaxation. So once it's stimulated, that latent period is kind of like the time it's taking for the acetylcholine to get there, for the impulse to get there, and for them to actually start contracting. Then it will contract, and then it will go through a period of relaxation. The length of the muscle fiber before stimulation is going to determine the amount of force that can actually be developed. Optimum starting length is the resting length of the muscle fiber. That allows the greatest force to be developed. Stretched muscle fibers develop less force because some of the myosin heads aren't going to be able to reach the binding sites on the actin. Shortened muscle fibers also develop less force because they're already compressed, so they can't get any shorter. So optimal length is the resting length. You're going to have a pure contraction. If it is already shortened, well now it has nowhere to go. It can't compress more. It can only compress as much as it can compress. So if it's overly shortened, you're not going to get as strong as a contraction because it's already in the partially contracted state. On the other hand, if it's stressed, same thing. You're not going to get as much strength because now that it's stretched, well, some of the myosin isn't going to be able to bind. So your power stroke isn't going to be as powerful. Summation happens when individual muscle fiber twitches combine. These produce sustained contractions and can lead to partial or complete tetanic contractions. So basically what happens is you have these muscle twitches. If they happen close enough together, they're going to combine and sum up to be a sustained contraction. If they happen too close together or if there's too many of them or if it's if there's too many stimuli or they're too close together, it can actually produce tetanus, which is just a sustained contraction. A motor unit is a motor neuron plus all of the muscle fibers that it controls. So if you look at the picture here, we got color codes. So motor neuron one, you have the purple ones. As you can see, it branches and it innervates all of those purple fibers. So that motor neuron plus all of those purple fibers are motor unit one. And the motor neuron two innervates the red fibers. So that would be motor unit two, that motor neuron plus those two red fibers that we can see. A whole muscle consists of a lot of motor units. Now remember these myofibrils are going to create a fascicle, which then fascicles create a muscle. So imagine how many motor units are inside of the actual muscle, which is made up of fascicles, which is made up of motor units. 
course, movements are going to be produced with large number of fibers in a motor unit, while precise movements produced, are produced with fewer in muscle fibers in a motor unit. So if you need a large grand movement, you need more power, so to speak, than if you need a smaller precise movement. Recruitment is an increase in the number of motor units activated so that we can get more force generated. Certain motor units are going to be activated first, and then if the stimulus intensity increases, others will be recruited in to be activated too. So as the intensity of the stimulation increases, motor recruitment is going to continue until we have all of the motor units activated and we can't increase it anymore. Smaller motor units are recruited first and then the larger ones are recruited later. Summation and recruitment can produce sustained contractions of increasing strength. Whole muscle contractions are actually smooth movements. Muscle tone is a continuous state of partial contraction in our resting muscles. Now everybody has different muscle tone. Those people who are in better shape have a better muscle tone than those who are not in shape at all. So the tone we have is just that constant state of partial contraction our muscles are in. We have different types of contractions. Isotonic is when the muscle contracts and changes length, but with an equal force. And then there's two types of there. Concentric is a shortening contraction. Eccentric is a lengthening contraction. And then isometric, the muscle contracts but does not change length. There's a change in force instead. So picture A shows you a concentric contraction. The muscle contracts with force greater than resistance and shortens. B shows you an eccentric contraction. The muscle contracts with the force less than resistance and lengthens shows you the isometric contraction, the muscle contracts, but does not change length. So for example, I have this book. If I'm going to move this book up and down, that's an isotonic contraction. Moving it up is concentric. Moving it down is eccentric. But if I'm just going to stay here and hold this book, so like I'm just holding this book, I'm not moving at all, that's going to be an isometric contraction. Okay? Hopefully that helps. We also have different types of fibers. We have fast twitch and slow twitch fibers. Slow twitch fibers are type 1. These are always oxidative. They're resistant to fatigue. They have abundant myoglobin. There's a good blood supply with a lot of mitochondria, which explains the abundant myoglobin and slow ATPase activity. So they're very slow to contract. Fast twitch fatigue resistant fibers are type 2A. These are intermediate twitch fibers. They have an intermediate oxidative capacity with an intermediate amount of myoglobin they're resistant to fatigue, but they have rapid ATPase activity. So they have less oxidative capacity in myoglobin than slow twitch fibers, but their ATPase activity is faster. Finally, fast twitch glycolytic fibers are type 2B. These are anaerobic respiration fibers, so glycolysis. They have less myoglobin, their blood supply isn't very good, they have fewer mitochondria, but they have more sarcoplasmic reticulum. They're susceptible to fatigue. They contract rapidly and have fast ATPase activity. So slow fibers are going to be slow to contract. Fast twitch glycolytic are going to be fast to contract. But then the fast twitch are fatigue resistant fibers. So you've got basically your slow twitch fibers, which are slow to contract. And then you have two different types of fast twitch fibers, which are going to be faster to contract. You have glycolytic, which are your anaerobic, and you have fatigue resistant, which are aerobic. Problems. If we do not use our skeletal muscles, they can atrophy, which means they decrease in size and strength. If we use them a lot, like we exercise, it causes hypertrophy, which is an enlargement of the skeletal muscle. Aerobic exercise is going to stimulate those slow twitch fibers. 
In response, the fibers are going to increase their blood supply and mitochondria for their myoglobin supply. Fourth row exercise stimulates mainly fast twitch fibers. In response, those fibers are going to produce new actin and myosin filaments and the muscles going to enlarge. So aerobic exercise is going to stimulate your oxygen capability and your blood supply. Forceful exercise is going to have the muscle enlarge, so like lifting weights. Smooth muscle compared to skeletal muscle, they're shorter. They have a single centrally located nucleus. They're elongated with tapered ends. The myofilaments are just random. They don't have striations or transverse tubules and the sarcoplasmic reticulum is not very well developed. There are two types, multi-unit and visceral. Multi-unit are less organized. They function as separate units. The fibers function independently. These are gonna be found in like the iris of the eye and walls of blood vessels. And these are stimulated by neurons and hormones. Visceral smooth muscle is single unit smooth muscle. So the cells respond as a unit. There are sheets of spindle fiber shaped muscles. The fibers are held together by gap junctions, which remember gap junctions are our communicating junctions. So ions can pass through, which allows them to function as a unit. They exhibit rhythmicity, which just goes back to them functioning as a unit. They conduct peristalsis, which is just a specialized movement where alternating groups of muscles will contract and relax. So it's like squeezing a tube of toothpaste. These are in the walls of most hollow organs and the more common type of smooth muscle. It resembles skeletal muscle contraction because there's that interaction between actin and myosin. And both use calcium and ATP and are triggered by the membrane impulses. But smooth muscle does not have troponin. Instead, it uses calmodulin. So there is a calcium calmodulin thing going on. The two neurotransmitters that affect it are acetylcholine and norepinephrine. Hormones can either stimulate or inhibit it. Stretching can also trigger smooth muscle contraction. Smooth muscle is very slow to contract and relax, but it is more resistant to fatigue. It can change length without changing its tautness at all. Cardiac muscle is located in the heart, it is striated. The muscle fibers are joined together by intercalated discs. Intercalated discs are basically gap junctions that allow the ions to cross over so that our heart can function as a unit. The fibers are branched, but they contain a single nucleus. The network again contracts as a unit, so syncytium. It is self-exciting and rhythmic, has a longer refractory period than skeletal muscle which means that it takes longer to respond to another stimulus than skeletal muscle does. There aren't any sustained or tetanic contractions, which is a good thing because if there was, our heart would stop working. This is just a summary of skeletal smooth and cardiac muscle. Over our lifespan, again, we know things are gonna go downhill. Myoglobin, ATP, and creatine phosphate start to decline in our 40s. Connective tissue and adipose cells start to replace some of the muscle tissue. And by age 80, almost half of our muscle mass has atrophied. So that's one reason why it's really important to try to stay active as you get older. Because getting older doesn't have to mean that you're just rolling over and dying. Getting older just means you're experiencing life. So stay active. Even if it's just a matter of parking farther away from Walmart and walking in or taking a walk around your block, anything. Use the stairs instead of the elevator. All of these things can help you stay in a little bit better shape. Our muscle strength starts to decrease, our reflexes become slower, but again, exercise is gonna help maintain our muscle mass and function. So exercise is really important to handling what's happening to us in life. It also is a very good way to get rid of stress. So exercise has so many benefits and it doesn't have to be really hard exercise. It can just be something like walking around the block. Walking around the block can actually help you clear your head. It can help you de-stress and it can help keep your muscles in shape. So take a walk and I will talk to you for the next chapter. Bye.